you are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting this morning to consider a few amendments to S348 that will be up on the floor of the House later this morning. Uh, we've got to get right to it because we have uh, a long list of folks who are with us today. Um, and so I'd like to go first to Scott Beck um, to explain to us what his amendment does and then we'll hear some different perspectives on that amendment. Okay, thank you. Um, so my amendment, I'm sure most of you are probably looking at it right there. Um, but what it effectively does is it, um, for, for the 2020 general election, it forbids um, candidates, uh, political parties, their family, uh, family members of candidates, political action committees, and others that are politically <laughs> interested from collecting ballots in the 2020 general election, if, if the um, Secretary of State makes the decision to um, do universal mail-in ballots. Um, the, uh, my rationale for doing this has nothing to do with the conversation that occurred on the floor on Wednesday. Um, I, it's not about voter fraud. I don't think there's much likelihood of voter fraud occurring in November if we do universal mail-in ballots. It has nothing to do with ballot harvesting, which um, I realize is legal in the state of Vermont, even though my personal opinion is it's unethical, uh, but I don't challenge that. Um, my um, reason for submitting this amendment to this bill is purely um, based in health, safety, wellness, and epidemiology. Uh, it would be highly irresponsible for the state of Vermont to send out universal mail-in ballots to everyone and then allow hordes of political operatives to go door to door um, in neighborhoods and apartment buildings and complexes where they have no idea who the people in those complexes are that could be infected. They have no idea who the people in those complexes and homes might be that might have underlying um, conditions that make them vulnerable to the COVID. And then to interact with them and move on to the next door and the next door and the next door. And who knows how many dozens or maybe even hundreds that they might get to. So um, this amendment is purely about health. It's purely about safety. It's purely about um, an environment where we uh, may be in a, um, a worse situation than we are now with the potential of the second wave. And I just, if we're going to follow the science and we're going to be looking out for the health and safety of Vermonters, uh, we cannot allow hordes of untrusted people to canvas neighborhoods and apartment complexes and risk the spread of this disease. Um, <clears throat> this would not preclude uh, trusted people from um, collecting and uh, uh, delivering a ballot for an individual that can't do that on their own. Uh, would not prevent friends, coworkers, colleagues, family members, clergy, the postman, uh, the board of civil authority or town clerk uh, from collecting a ballot from an individual and getting it to the proper place. Um, and of course we have the last line of defense is that I, as I understand it, if we were to do this, um, everybody will receive a, um, a stamped envelope. So all they have to do is put it in the, the ma outgoing mailbox at their place of residence and it would get where it needed to go. Um, I think I've said everything I need to say. I'm available for questions. Committee members, do you have any questions for Representative Beck on the content of his amendment? Jim Harrison. Thank you, um, Scott, for joining us this morning. Um, you know, I guess we might have been looking at it from, you know, a little different vantage point. Um, but now that you bring up the health concerns, which is the whole reason for mailing out ballots in the first place, um, you've convinced me that I will not go out and collect ballots. Thank you. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, Scott, um, 
Now, this I think would prevent justices of the peace from going out and doing their functions under the law, which is to help, um, you know, people get their ballots because they're on the ballot. John, I, I missed the first part of your conversation, or your first okay. part of your comment. So my, my question is justice of the peace. Um, they're on the ballot. Um, so they would be prevented from doing their job of, you know, going out with another justice of the peace um, and assisting um, in returning ballots as they are allowed to do under the law. My, um, my interpretation of that it would be that if that justice of the peace is operating in their official capacity as a justice of the peace, and if they are asked to go out and collect a ballot from somebody who could not find any other way to get a ballot in, um, that that would not um, that would not trigger a violation of this um, statute. There would may it, be people that have a different opinion of how the language reads, but that's my that's my interpretation. If somebody's acting in their official capacity, whether it's a postman, a town clerk, board of some of them operating in their official capacity, um, not on behalf of a political group or any of these other ones that I list here, then that they would not be subject to. So what if I'm chair of my democratic town committee and my neighbor asks me to pick up his or her ballot and deliver it to the clerk? Is that a violation of this amendment? I would I would say no, because in that situation, you are not acting on behalf of the Democratic Party in your town. You are acting as a trusted person that um, was contacted by a, a friend that trusts you and asked you to do that. I would not um, I would not view that as a violation of this idea. Well, I guess that leads me to my, my most important question, which is how how, how would this be enforced? I mean, because, you know, in that instance, you know, if I'm chair of my Democratic town committee, I could be acting at, at, on behalf of that committee, or I could be just collecting ballots from my neighbors. Um, I, would, I would suspect it would receive about the same level of enforcement as almost all election law is in Vermont, which is that there is very little enforcement um, or capacity to do that but we set the rules out and we tell the, um, the people that are running and the people that are part of the process, these are the rules and you need to follow them. And if, if you don't and it's discovered that you didn't, then uh, there, is, there are repercussions. But um, I would imagine it would be just as enforceable as all other election law in the state of Vermont. Um, so you, you, you have a long list here of people who can't um, uh, return ballots. Are, are these people less healthy or more dangerous than people, other people who may return ballots? No, they're, they're, they're likely not. I can't think of any epidemiological reason why those people would be um, more vulnerable to COVID than any, anybody else. The, the difference though, is that if they're acting on behalf of their political committee and they're going door to door, there's a very high likelihood that they have no idea who um, anything about the people that live in that in that domicile, whether they're infected or whether they have underlying medical conditions that might make them vulnerable to COVID, and they shouldn't be um, they shouldn't be doing that. Um, the depart the direction right now from the Vermont Department of Health is that um, you shouldn't be interacting with anybody that's not trusted, that you don't know and you don't know, you know what you don't know anything about them, and effectively. In most most cases, um, people that are working for campaigns or on behalf of campaigns or political parties, um, they're by nature, un, in a medical sense, are untrusted because they don't know anything about the people they're going to be interacting with. And I think that is the direction right now from the Vermont Department of Health. Don't 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 have gatherings. Don't interact with people you don't trust and you don't know you don't know them. All right, thank you. Mike Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Chair, <laughs> um, I have a few questions. Now, I know our connections are not always that good, but I believe I heard the word hordes, H-O-R-D-E-S. Is that accurate, Representative Beck? 
I think it can be depending on um, what town you live in and how competitive the, the race is. So is, is, do you have evidence that there have been hordes of ballot collectors? In, in my community, there are people that actively go out and um, are looking to collect ballots. They get the list of ballots that have been mailed out and who those people are, and they, they do go around. I can't speak for every other sure community. Sure, not. I can only speak for mine. And does that constitute a horde? I'm, I'm looking for a definition of horde because I have, I I don't have, have in my number. mind, a I, I don't have a number. Large number. I don't have a number, but I can tell you that a, a number, a large, I mean, dozens of people will go out there in my community and do that. Whether you call that a horde or not, I don't know. Um, but mm -hmm. there are people that are going through communities. Uh, whether it's one or a hundred, I don't think it matters a whit, that are um, going to doors, seeking ballots, and returning them. And, and that, you know, like I said, I, I realize that's a legal practice in Vermont. I'm not going to weigh in on, the, on that. I'm just saying that whether it's one or a hundred, if people are going through a neighborhood in a, when we're in the middle of a pandemic, not knowing anything about the people they are interacting with, and then going on to the next house and the next house and the next apartment building that there's a health and safety issue there. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative, I am very sympathetic to what you're trying to do here, but I can't get behind this language. It seems to be excessively broad, aside from the point that John brought up about uh, the JPs doing their job. It seems like it would scoop like AARP and Cove and a bunch of organizations that are, are going to be assisting elderly people um, who we really don't want on the street uh, to, to, you know, do their constitutionally guaranteed right to vote. Um, I have no idea what a lobbyist employer is, but uh, it, this just seems to be a little vague and reaches pretty far. Um, so that's... Well, I, I think, um, you know, I would certainly be um, receptive to if the committee wanted to uh, fine tune the language, um, but you know, I think in the environment that we're in, it's it's necessary to err on the side of safety and of being conservative. And you know, I think there's a there's a big difference between somebody, and, and maybe the language needs to be tightened up a little bit. But I think there's a big difference between an elderly person that says, you know, hey, I don't I don't have anybody that can that I trust that I can collect this ballot from. I can't figure out how to put it in the the mailbox even though there's a stamped envelope there and they call the AARP or some other um, group that, that assists our elderly and says, Hey, I, I can't figure this out. Can you send somebody to help me? And I, in my mind, I don't think that that would violate this statute because this is not the AARP going to people that in collecting this is an, an individual that is reaching out and trying to find a trusted person to do this on their behalf. And, and maybe the language could be uh, tightened up a little bit and I'd be receptive to those types of ideas. But I, I, think, I, I think there's a difference there. And I, I think we also have to look at this from a common sense perspective too. Well, I, I, like I said, I'm sympathetic to what you're trying to do, but the language has so many, it could be's in it that it, it, I don't think I can support it as written. Yeah, I think by its nature it does because, um, you know, we have a lot of people in Vermont and we're not unique, but that operate in different capacities. You know, we have people that are part of political parties that are fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, and they're trusted people to a certain group of people. Um, and, you know, that's in my mind, not a violation. Um, but um, for that matter, we might have postmen that might collect thousands of these things they're doing that in their official capacity. They're not out, you know, going to another postal route and knocking on every door. Um, so I, I think, I think there's some common sense here. And I think that we, um, you know, it's, it's, 
what, what's the intent? What's the purpose? Are you, are you operating in a, an official capacity? Are you a trusted individual? Have you been requested to do this for somebody to help them out? Or are you just literally out going to places you have no idea what's going on there and, and just looking for ballots? Thank you, Madam Chair. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, Scott, as I think we've seen since the beginning of the COVID-19 emergency, as the governor has put out emergency orders, various state agencies have put out directives and guidance uh, about how to comply with those orders. For example, you know, indoor dining, there are specific directives that have been put out with respect to that. Outdoor dining, the same, you know, with respect to outdoor recreation. I mean, you name the, the sector of the of businesses or or municipalities, there's been guidance put out by various agencies um, across the state. Can't the Secretary of the State provide guidance um, to protect the health of voters and others um, that would be better, you know, deal with this issue better than this amendment? I, you know, I, I think it's, I think, I think two things. I think it's important for the legislature to say what we mean and put that out there. And I also think that I, I'm not sure the Secretary of State is the most um, relevant opinion. I mean, I th I'd call the Secretary of Health, call Dr. Levine, see what he says. This well, is, I mean, this is a, I'm not, I'm not arguing that, um, that the Secretary of State doesn't know how to run an election. I'm saying that this is unsafe. Well, I'm sure, like maybe many other the other Vermont Department have, of Health to testify, the, the Secretary of State would consult with the Department of Health and Dr. Levine um, with respect to these well, issues. Then, uh, yeah, sure, he, um, he may, may very well be, but I think if your committee is going to do its due diligence, I think you ought to you ought to contact the Vermont Department of Health and see what they think. Okay, thank you. I believe the Vermont Department of Health. Um, does not have a crystal ball to understand the rate of infection <laughs> that will be present in September, October, and November. Um, Jim Harrison, and then Hal Colston, and then uh, we I, move on. I thought we were planning for a worst case scenario here. I guess I must have missed that. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, earlier, it was raised about um, a just question about justice of the peace. Um, it, it may uh, already be covered in Title 172456, uh, where it talks about, uh, um, you know, unless the, uh, you know, moderator, justice of the peace, town clerk, treasurer, ward clerk, inspector of elections that are acting in their um, official capacity. Uh, so I think um, the issue of whether a JP can collect a ballot um, is already covered under existing law whether or not they are a candidate for office. Thank you. Hal Colston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Beck, for bringing this amendment forward. Um, however, I see this as a continuation of the delays that began about two months ago to this process of putting in place the, our all mail-in ballot voting process. Um, I believe we need to act now. Time is of the essence. And to be honest, um, I want to follow up on the point that Representative Gannon made. Um, of all the directives that are out there, I know Secretary Condos. I've known him for a long time. And I know him to be a person of integrity. And I trust that he and his team will do the right thing for all Vermont voters. And they will come up with a comprehensive directive that will address the issues that you brought up. But what it will do, it will put it in place now. We don't have time to wait. We need to keep our eye on the prize, and that's the safety of our Vermont voters. And we can't afford any more delays. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Um, so I think at this point, it's probably a good idea to hear um, from the Secretary of State and his elections team. So Jim, um, your thoughts on the Beck Amendment. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the need for for the Beck Amendment uh, as it's written. Uh, I do think um, 
probably an easier way to, to deal with this is if, if it really truly is a health concern, then perhaps we should stop all in-person campaigning as well. Uh, because you're going to, you're not going to know who you're talking to when you walk up to them to, to campaign. Um, I think that this, this language is so overly broad that it has a, um, a lot of unintended consequences. Um, for instance, do you want to stop AARP from helping people? Do you want to stop League of Women Voters from helping people? Do you want to stop uh, Planned Parenthood or the NRA or Right to Life? I mean, that's that's these are the people and organizations that that would be um, uh, not allowed to do any provide any assistance um, when it comes to labor organizations. Uh, mental health workers are, are now unionized. Social workers are, are unionized. Nurses are unionized. Uh, are we going to say that they can't do this because it's not collecting ballots would not be a normal part of their ballot of their uh, uh, duties? Um, and I'm not saying that they are out there collecting ballots. I'm just saying that if a senior that they were providing care to asked for their help, you know, do do we really want to? limit that person. So it, it, I, I think essentially um, this law has been in place uh, for decades um, and it's never been a problem before. Um, I think that this, the one thing that I do agree with, with uh, Scott Beck about, Representative Beck, is that the whole idea behind this uh, is, is to protect the public's health. Um, and, and that is true. Uh, I, I think that this amendment is really trying to uh, put belts and suspenders on something that's already illegal. Uh, and I'm not talking about ballot harvesting. I'm talking about ballot return. Uh, ballot, ballot harvesting, frankly, is a, um, to put it bluntly, is a dog whistle. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, something that, that uh, is put out there to uh, denoted as, as illegal. Uh, returning ballots is not illegal. We have a process in place and we have several laws in place that protect every reason, every single piece of this is protected by law. And actually, I think Chris uh, will probably speak to that when he speaks. Um, we have a lot of seniors in this state, myself included. Uh, and and uh, you know, many of these folks need help getting their ballots returned. Um, this is not, it's already illegal to um, uh, influence a voter. It's already illegal to cast more than one ballot. It's already illegal to show someone how you're voting. Uh, it's already illegal to impersonate someone. I, 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 just, I just don't understand this. I will say one thing and I will, on the record, on the record to this committee, and, and to anyone that's listening, uh, I will, in my directive, when we finally make a decision on, on the procedures going forward, I will issue a part of my directive will be that candidates cannot pick up ballots. Uh, I do agree that that is an issue that should be dealt with. I don't think it needs to be put in the law right now. I think that the law actually should be revisited in the fall, in the, uh, in the next January. When, when you folks are back in, in session, um, it, this is, this is going to need a lot of debate. Uh, and, and I think we want to be careful. You don't want to pass a law quickly and then have unintended consequences uh, that prevent anyone from getting their ballot back to their town clerk. Um, I'll stop there. And I don't know if there's any questions or if you want to let Chris uh, speak on, on the uh, uh penalties and, and uh, the law as it is now. Rob LeClaire has a question and then we'll go to Chris. Thank you. Actually, I don't have a question, Madam Chair. I, it's just a statement, but I can wait if you'd like until after others have had a chance to testify. Thank you. So, Leave your hand up and I'll get to you right after that. Thank you. Very good. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Chris Winters, Deputy Secretary of State. And first of all, I'd like to reiterate that this concern about back Ballot return is probably going to be a, a relatively small issue because as has been said, the plan is to make it very easy for voters to simply put their ballots in the mail 
with a prepaid envelope addressed to their town clerk. So ballot collection hopefully is, is not going to be very necessary out there. Uh, that said, the amendment before you is, is problematic from our viewpoint and Secretary Condos covered a lot of that. We would see this as you can hear just from the discussion in committee as very difficult to interpret, uh, very difficult to monitor, to investigate and to enforce. Um, and I would also say it assumes the worst of every person and every organization out there, no matter their political affiliation. There are many, many individuals and organizations that might want to go out and encourage more people to vote or, or do legitimate assistance to voters who might not otherwise have the ability to get their ballots back in any other way. But this assumes that not only will someone collect those ballots, but they'll also tamper with them in some way. And there are some voters out there who legitimately need this assistance in order to get their ballot cast. There are disabled Vermonters, older Vermonters, new Americans living in Vermont who lack reliable transportation. They might reside in um, geographically remote areas where they rely on others to retrieve and return their mail. Barring third party assistance with absentee voting very well could disenfranchise many of those Vermonters. So absentee ballot assistance is, is critical to a number of Vermonters. So we need to be really careful, as you've already heard, in placing any restrictions on that. Uh, although we do see some as necessary, we wanna be very careful and thoughtful about it. Any town clerk will tell you that voters get their absentee ballots back to them in a variety of ways and through a variety of trusted people and these amendments would make it very difficult to figure out who can and who can't. Um, so what you'd effectively be saying is that, uh, as was already said, a, a, a disability rights group, a new American support group, a company focused on assisting the elderly, um, a, a church, uh, a veteran support group, they, they would have a hard time knowing whether they could knock on a door to offer help. Um, in a recent Arizona court case, the Ninth Circuit of Appeals struck down a limitation on third party assistance as discriminatory. And according to that court, minority voters were more likely than other voters to rely on assistance casting their absentee ballots for a variety of reasons, including issues with, with transportation and with mail service. So I don't think that's what any of us are want to do here or are trying to do here, especially in this moment. Um, so, so what is the, the problem that we're trying to solve? When you hear the term ballot harvesting, it's often used to criticize two very different sets of practices. There's the illegal and illegitimate absentee ballot tampering. And then there's the legal and legitimate assistance to voters who need help casting their absentee ballots. And voter assistance is not evidence of election fraud. So ballot tampering is illegal everywhere. It's already illegal. It includes practices like stealing ballots from mailboxes filling out other people's ballots without their consent and changing or throwing out other people's ballots. And that case in North Carolina that we always hear, hear brought forward as the danger of, of ballot harvesting, everyone points to that as, as an example. Um, the Republican operatives there were collecting ballots, which is already against the law in North Carolina. That didn't stop them. And then they also engaged in many other illegal behaviors, including tampering, all illegal. So uh, we thought it was important that you hear quickly from us what is already against the law in Vermont, uh, because I think that's what we're, we're already talking about here. Uh, I would refer you to a memo from the Director of Elections, Will Senning, to me, which is uh, posted on your committee page. Um, and I'll just, uh, I'll walk through some of the Offenses Against the Purity of Elections, which is a, a great title. Chapter 35 of Title 17, Offenses Against the Purity of Elections. It is illegal to cast more than one ballot. That's in section 1971. Uh, a voter who knowingly casts more than one ballot, uh, and I'm abbreviating here, shall be fined not more than $1,000 if the offense is committed in a primary or a general election and not more than $100 if committed at a, at a local election. Uh, next, a voter cannot show someone how they're going to vote. That's in section 1972. 
A voter who, except in cases of assistance as provided in this title, allows his or her ballot to be seen by another person with an apparent intention of letting it be known how he or she is about to vote shall be fined $1,000. Next, it's illegal to impersonate another person voting, specifically including deceased persons. This is subject to up to one year in prison and a fine of not more than $200 uh, or both. That's in section 2015 of Title 17. Section 2017, undue influence. It is illegal to unduly influence another person as to how they vote. So any person who attempts by bribery, threats, or undue influence to dictate, control, or alter the vote of a voter about to be given at a local primary or general election shall be fined not more than $200. Uh, just a couple more here. It is illegal to intercept or destroy a person's absentee ballot materials. That's in section 2019, and it's called destroying lists and hindering voting. A person who prior to a local primary or general election willfully defaces or destroys any list of candidates posted in accordance with law, willfully defaces, tears down, removes or destroys any card posted for the instruction of voters or during that election, willfully removes or destroys any of the supplies or conveniences furnished to enable a voter to prepare his or her ballot or willfully hinders the voting of others shall be fined $200. It's, uh, last one here, it's illegal to falsely sign, destroy, or deface another person's ballot. That's in addition to the pains and uh, the penalties of perjury associated with signing for another person on the certificate envelope. That's in Title 17, Section 2021, the destruction of or fraudulent acts pertaining to primary election documents, alteration or delay of ballots. Anyone who forges or falsely makes the official endorsement upon a ballot to be used at a primary or at an election or willfully destroys or defaces such a ballot or willfully delays the delivery of such ballots shall be fined $200. And last, um, I, I have also included, uh, Director Senning included in his memo, the typical language that is on an early or absentee ballot. Uh, there's a statement there where you print your name and you swear or affirm under the pains and penalties of perjury that you're a legal voter, uh, that you're not voting in any other jurisdiction uh, except your jurisdiction in the state of Vermont and that in voting you have marked your ballot in private and have not allowed any person to observe the marking of the ballot except for those authorized to assist voters under law. Uh, and there's also a statement that says, I have not been influenced. My signature and the date below indic indicate when I completed this document. And then you are signing that the information on this form is true, accurate, and complete to the best of your knowledge. You understand that a material misstatement of fact in the completion of this document may constitute grounds for conviction of perjury. Uh, so we hope that that answers some of your questions about what is already illegal and what it seems like uh, these amendments are attempting to prevent, which is not just the return of ballots, but it is the tampering with uh, and the illegal behavior with those ballots once they've returned them. So uh, uh, to conclude, at the end of the day, we think we should leave it to the elections experts to figure out the uh, directive and uh, what the return of ballots should include so that we don't unintentionally disenfranchise a number of voters. Uh, we will, as Secretary Kondo said, issue a directive addressing the return of ballots. It will address candidates and it will take into account the delicate balance between much needed voter assistance and the potential for voter interference, which is real and is out there and we do take seriously. Uh, we hope you remain focused on what's really important here, which is per the proposed mailing to voters of their ballots in the fall to address this pandemic, uh, to address uh, every Vermonter's ability to vote safely, making sure they can vote in November and get their votes back to the town clerks and have their votes counted. Really appreciate the time in front of the committee um, and we would ask you to uh, reject uh, the proposed amendment. Rob LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll try to keep this brief. 
Um, there's there's been a couple statements made that I guess I have to uh, respond to. One is there's nothing about this amendment that postpones this process whatsoever. Secretary of State has already been given the authority to do what he needs to do. It's my understanding that all the supplies have been ordered. We've got providers secured. There's nothing that will delay this. This is all about the safety after in November. Um, the reason that we're doing this is because of safety. Yes, the Secretary of State is the ultimate authority on elections, but he is not the ultimate authority on health. Um, you know, we're still, if we're in a state of emergency still, even then, if we have a flare up of this, does that mean that the governor can go through and, and have an executive order that talks about the fact that people can't vote in person? Um, we've already got processes in place to do this. This is just clarifying it. The, sec the deputy secretary of state went through a litany of organizations of groups of people that he feels should be allowed to go interact with our most vulnerable population. I guess I, I have some concerns about that. Um, this isn't about ballot harvesting. This is about the safety of our residents and the voters in the most vulnerable population. So if we're going to do this, which again, we already have, the Secretary of State has the authority to do that, let's do it appropriately and let's mean what we say and that we're concerned about our most vulnerable population and our poll workers. <coughs> I think every community that you're allowed to vote in, there's just as a piece, there's other ways to get the ballots there that's appropriate. We don't want a bunch of people going door to door that don't know anybody. Um, there's a lot of communities down there, Montpelier is one of them, where you, you can't go into a retail establishment now without wearing a mask. If we have a flare up again, you know, look what's going on in Winooski. I think we had 19 more new cases the day before yesterday. This is not going to go away. And as the governor opens things up more and more and we have more interaction amongst ourselves, it's very reasonable. In fact, it's going to, we're going to have more cases. So I absolutely support this amendment. I want to keep Vermonters safe and our elections safe. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, just to uh, manage the time here, we are 40 minutes into our committee meeting. We've got the floor in about 20 minutes. So what I'm going to do right now is invite Representative Sherman to introduce her amendment, and then uh, we will hear from uh, other perspectives on um, on not only her amendment, but the Beck amendment. Um, and then we will take our, uh, our committee vote uh, towards the end of this hour. So thank you. Go ahead, Heidi. You might want to unmute yourself. Nope. Not hearing you. Do you want to leave the meeting and come back in? Um, that might uh, that might help, or call in with the with the phone number that's included in the invitation. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, Butch Representative Shaw here. She just on chat. She said she can't get unmuted. Yeah. Um, I am seeing that she is un I'm I can unmute her I believe but I'm not being I'm not able to hear her. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. She's coming in on the phone. Um, okay. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. Would it, in the interest of time while we're waiting for Representative Sherman, um, would you like to vote on um, 
Representative Beck amendment? Um, and if so, I would move that we find it favorable. Um, I, I'm going to wait and vote at the end um, because okay. I still would like to have time to hear from the perspective of AARP um, and also the National Vote from Home Institute if we have time. So I am going to off on that. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Oh, Sarah? yes, we can. Thank you, Heidi. Okay, sorry. Oh, I hope this doesn't happen on the floor. Um, okay, so um, thank you, Madam uh, Chair and the committee. You just muted yourself. Didn't mute. Okay, I, I didn't now, mute. now you're good. <laughs> Somebody else muted, whatever. Anyway, thank you, Madam Chair, for um, inviting me to, to speak to you about the bill, um, about my amendment to S348. And my amendment is simple, albeit the Secretary of State um, preempted it, uh, which um, I recognized, but uh, I will say my amendment is very simple. Um, um, we approved earlier this year, uh, with my support, um, the mailing out of ballots to all Vermonters for the 2020 general election. Uh, obviously, the proposed change in this bill it, um, would eliminate the governor from that process. But as we were discussing this on the floor on Wednesday, um, a line of questioning sparked my uh, interest and significant concern, frankly, um, um, that I hadn't, hadn't really thought about in the past. Um, it became clear during that line of questioning and my subsequent follow-up um, that candidates who are on the ballot, whose names are on the ballot, can actually go uh, and harvest ballots, collect them. That is, they can collect them and return them to um, an, election, um, an election headquarters or the town clerk. Um, this actually really, really surprised me. I've been in office for 14 years, um, been through seven campaigns, and not once, not once, have I collected a ballot from somebody um, to return to the town clerk. Um, or election headquarters. Um, I thought it was completely inappropriate. I wouldn't have even thought of it, um, that, that, uh, that that was even possible. Um, I naturally uh, assumed that it wasn't. I, I actually didn't even think about it. So I naturally assumed after this, when this uh, line of inquiry came up that it was not allowed. Um, after all, candidates like us are not allowed even close to ballots, even in the vicinity of ballots on election day. Um, uh, why would candidates be allowed um, to collect such ballots prior to election day? Um, those ballots are just as sacrosanct prior to election day as they are on election day. Are they not? Are they not, Madam Speaker? So my amendment is simple. It replaces section C with another new section C that will make it clear that candidates who are on the ballot cannot collect and return ballots um, on behalf of anybody but themselves. An obvious addition to this is uh, candidate families and candidate staff um, would also be prohibited. Um, our elections, um, Madam Speaker, um, must be actually free and fair uh, and they must be perceived as free and fair. Allowing a candidate whose name is on the ballot to collect ballots from anybody, from any person, um, is completely inappropriate and clearly violates the perception of free and fair election. Um, so Madam Speaker, uh, Madam Chair, I ask uh, that this committee support this amendment. I think it is, uh, it is the right thing to do, regardless of political party or politics in general. Um, I believe you know it's the right thing to do. Vermonters deserve nothing less. Uh, Representative Kitzmiller. Unmute yourself. Here we go. Sorry. Here we go. So well, good morning. As I as I read both uh, Representative Beck and Representative Sherman's amendments, I, I find them to be basically going after the same thing. They use slightly different language, but these two amendments are remarkably similar. 
and I think uh, I think we can we can cover them both with one vote. Uh, I'm not persuaded by either one. Uh, I I have great faith and trust in the Secretary of State's office and everything that the Assistant Secretary or Deputy Secretary of State said, and in uh, the Director of Elections, and I'm confident that they can run a fair process and explain it well. Uh, so that, that, that's my comment. I, I'm not going to support either one of these amendments. Uh, Representative Shaw as a co-sponsor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for taking up uh, Representative Sherman's amendment. Uh, I, I do support it, obviously, as a, a co-sponsor. I've been a Justice of the Peace since 1973. Been through many, many elections. Uh, I've lived with Chapter 17 over those years. Many phone calls with the Secretary of State and to Chris and Will Snedding both. This is a good amendment, and I was glad to hear uh, Secretary Kondo say uh, he'll do a directive uh, directing this action to happen. Uh, 17 BSA is full of uh, laws that protect keep candidates away from ballots in a polling place. And I would like to think now that people's homes are an extension of the polling place. I would direct you also to say that this, uh, this, this amendment is strictly li li linked to the 2020 election only. And so this is a piece of belts and suspenders of something that the secretary approves of. And I would hope that we would gain some support uh, in, in your amendment and in, in your committee you know, a lot of times elections are, are uh, perspective and voter perspective and anything we as candidates can do to make sure that we, we show the right thing to do is a good thing. And this, this particular amendment will help us do that. So that's my spiel. And one other thing, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I would hope when you go to the floor today, you clearly state that H61 is all, 681 is already passed. We've already authorized voting by mail. And this is in simply a, a removal of the governor from the process, just a notification uh, to the governor, because I think people have misread this bill more than once. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, I think you're right. Although I think I did say that pretty clearly the first time around, but I appreciate the tip. Uh, Secretary well, Condos, can you weigh in um, briefly on the Sherman Amendment? Um, I know you already gave us a good rundown of the previous amendment. Sure. Uh, so again, I don't think it's necessary because I've already committed to publicly to, to uh, include this in a directive. Um, and, and frankly, almost everything that was that this is designed to do is already covered by uh, law. There are already penalties in place for almost everything that, that uh, could possibly be done. Um, I, I agree that, that, that the issue of, of candidates picking up ballots is not a good idea. It should, it should not happen. But we need to have this discussion in a much longer debate that has that deals with a lot of these issues. Uh, that also uh, looks at, at the other aspects that that the representative Beck brought up, not just this alone. So, you know, part of the problem we have is we need to move this bill, and we need to get this to the governor's desk as quickly as possible. Um, uh, we, we still have contracts we have to sign, uh, and, and we have to, we have to be in a position. There are other states, many other states that are actually implementing vote by mail and supplies and procurement, uh, uh, the mail houses. Yes, we have ours lined up, but we need to make sure that we can, we can cover that we're covered completely for this. This is really about the voter being able to cast a ballot. It's their right and to be able to do it without sacrificing their health and safety. And if health and safety is really the issue, I, I, you know, this, then we should outlaw campaigning for this year. We should, we should outlaw um, uh, any kind of interaction. That's what, that's, it is why we did, did away with the, um, the signature requirement because we were going to have 50,000 Vermonters 
that would be signing someone's petition papers. So we had to get away from that. But this is a completely different animal. Uh, and frankly, we are providing postage paid envelopes, uh, which will make it very easy for people. I, you know, uh, Representative Beck talked about hordes of people uh, out campaigning. We haven't had that kind of a situation anywhere in the state in the past. And all of a sudden this year, we're going to have hordes of people. I just don't buy it. I, I just don't buy it. Uh, thank you. Marcia Gardner. Thank you, Madam Chair. This election is already going to be different. And the more restrictions and stipulations we add to it, the more confusing it's going to be for the voters. I agree with Representative Colston that we need to move this along so the Secretary of State's office can set up a secure and safe way for voters to vote. I will not be supporting either one of these amendments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I wanna uh, ask Carol Dawes to, um, to weigh in for a moment uh, as a local elections official and as somebody who speaks regularly with town clerks from around the state, I um, would love to hear your perspective on what the impact would be to your processes if one or the other of these were to pass. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I know that you've got uh, a very short window of time here. So I just wanna lay out uh, one uh, scenario. Um, I can imagine, as I testified to this committee earlier, that uh, I have a lot of situations where neighbors go out and collect ballots from each other and bring them in. Um, and most of those come to the polls. When the voter comes to the polls, they bring three or four other ballots. And, and all I can imagine is that situation happening and I have to deny, I, I have to refuse to accept those ballots because they're not being... Uh, because they're in conflict with the, the, the new, a new restriction that would say that these people can't be uh, returning these ballots. And I'm not sure what that means. If I can't accept the ballots, then those voters have been denied their right to vote. Um, and so I think that uh, the current law says the ballots can be returned by any means. And I think that that's an important uh, uh, option for voters to continue to have. Thank you, Carol. Um, Greg Marshallden um, from AARP has been with us for a number of these conversations um, and would welcome you to give us some, some uh, thoughts on these amendments. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I wanna remind everyone that AARP is a nonpartisan organization. We don't endorse candidates for public office. We don't oppose candidates. We don't have a political action committee. We don't donate to PACs. We don't donate to parties. I just want to be clear, but we do have over 135,000 members in the state. And as all of you know, many of them vote. On April 3rd, I testified uh, in the Senate uh, Govern Government Operations Committee on the urgent need to activate emergency voting provisions you passed in response to the unprecedented global pandemic in order to address the very real concerns of, health and, of the health and safety of Vermonters they're gonna be forced to congregate in person at voting sites on election day. That was 10 weeks ago. Two and a half months have now passed and here we are still facing some uncertainty about whether or not we're going to actually have a safe election here in Vermont. As of this late date, I ask you to please vote no on any amendments to this minor adjustment to legislation you already passed and are only amending because the governor decided after signing the law that he does not want to be a part of making decisions about how Vermonters vote on election day. All you have to do is open the <clears throat> newspaper or have a look at what happened in Georgia the other day to see how bad this can get. And we cannot allow that to happen here in Vermont. So we strongly uh, encourage you to concur with the Senate on the third reading so that we can start educating and preparing Vermonters, all Vermonters, um, for a smooth, safe, and accessible election. We cannot afford to waste one more minute here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a few representatives of the National Vote at Home Institute, and, um, and I wanna give a brief moment for Amber McReynolds, who has jumped up and is ready to uh, shed some light on what, uh, what the National 
Vote at Home Institute thinks of um, restricting ballot return. Well, hi, members of the committee, and thanks for uh, inviting us to participate in this uh, session today. Um, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit national organization, and our core focus is on vote by mail and vote at home policies and procedures, and we help states uh, improve the, those procedures. And I just first want to commend the state of Vermont and certainly Secretary Condos for taking action to prepare for the fall election. Uh, we're not seeing that across the country. We're actually very concerned about many states not being prepared for either an emergency contingency plan or uh, for an expanded use of vote at home. And so we just really appreciate the state of Vermont and this committee and Secretary Condos for leading in that area because it's just critical and we're very concerned about the, the timing before the election right now to take action. Um, I, you know, I don't think the amendment is needed uh, this is certainly an area that we um, that we monitor very closely around the country. States vary in terms of their procedures and and what's in place around this. In fact, most states don't actually have provisions against um, uh, ballot collection as it's as it's talked about here. Uh, it seems to me that Secretary Condos and the staff at the Secretary of State's office will uh, certainly consider all health and safety considerations as they administer uh, this process. And to me, that's where you want to you want to has a, you want to have a lot of specificity around these sorts of procedures so that they can be adjusted and they can be agile and they can be more nimble as they're implemented. Uh, whenever we add things into the law in terms of specifics like this, sometimes it can actually complicate things down the road if if the dynamics change on the ground. So our recommendation would would be to uh, leave that to the Secretary of State's office so that they can be nimble and they can adjust uh, accordingly in the fall as things change on the ground. Um, and then certainly just, you know, overall, there are, there are people facing significant barriers in the voting process. We've already seen issues come up across the country in primaries with fairly low turnout. So I would just encourage and, and again, appreciate that you're being expansive in all the policies and laws that you're considering today. Thank Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. Uh, Representative Sherman wants to make another pitch. Oh, it's not another pitch. It's just to be clear, my amendment is much different uh, than the Beck Amendment. And I would hope that you address them separately because they are much different from one another. And it seems like this uh, combining of them is, is where you're headed as a committee. So I would ask that you not do that. Committee, any questions, comments, um, any other uh, answers you need before we move forward with um, making a decision on these? Uh, Scott Beck. Thank you. Um, so I just want to just take a 30 seconds here. Um, there was a lot of uh, secretary and deputy, um, I think a lot of confusion of the subject. Uh, this is about health and safety. Uh, it doesn't go into First Amendment. Uh, I didn't restrict campaigning. It doesn't stop any group, AARP or any others, from informing or, or um, you know, phone, mail, text, poster, whatever, telling people how to find a trusted person to collect their ballot. This is this is purely about the health and safety and wellness of Vermonters. And um, if we think it's good, I, mean, I guess if you think it's good policy to have untrusted people going through neighborhoods during a pandemic, you, know, you can make that decision. I think that's a, a very poor health decision for Vermonters. Committee, any questions before we move forward? So Marsha, I believe that there is a motion on the table from Representative Harrison to find the Beck Amendment favorable. Is that correct, Rep Harrison? Your motion was on the Beck Amendment? Yes. Yes, Madam Chair. All right. So yes means you are in favor of the Beck Amendment. No means you're not. And are we ready? Yes. Okay. Gannon. No. Kitz Miller. Warren Kitz Miller. Oh, no. Merlewicki. No. LeClaire. Yes. Harrison. Yes. Gardner. No. 
Classic. Yes. Cooper. I vote no. Brownell. I vote no. Colston. No. Brooklyn Hansis. No. So we have three yes, eight no, zero absent. Thank you very much. Who wants to make a motion on the Sherman Amendment? I'll make that motion that we find it favorable, Madam Chair. All right, we'll give Marsha a moment to okay. prepare the question. I'm ready. Gannon? No. Kitzmiller? No. Mowicki? No. LeClaire? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Gardner? No. Classic? Yes. Cooper? No. Brownell? No. Colston? No. Copeland Hansis? No. Three, eight, zero. So neither motion of the motions carry. Thank you, committee. Thank you, members of the public for being with us this morning. Um, we are needing to pop off abruptly because we are late for floor. So um, I will see you all in another Zoom in a moment.